I'm Grace Cavalier, and this is The Poet and the Poem. They're celebrating a very important book. It is an anthology, Singing in the Dark. It has a special theme, Poetry in Response to the Pandemic. And it is a fabulous book. It has 100 poets in 20 languages, and they come across six continents. It is a feast. We have the editor here, Nishi Shawa, and we have three other poets who are all who are in the book. They're going to read you samples of their own work, and then they're going to read you some things from the book. I'm Grace Cavalieri, and we're really happy to be celebrating this book. So I'm going to introduce the poet. Ann Bracken, do you want to give a, sh a hand when I say your name? Yeah. Diane Wilbin Parks, Jeffrey Himes, mm -hmm. Nishi Shava, and she is the editor, co-editor, and she'll tell us all about how she got this scheme and what it took to put together. So let's start by hearing a poem from each of our poets who are in the book. And I will tell you about Anne Bracken just quickly. Anne's awesome. She's an artist. She's a poet. She's a humanist. She um, works for reform in education, prison, and and mental health. So she's no slouch. <laughs> and Anne is uh, an activist and a poet. So let's hear one of your poems. Okay, thank you, Grace. It's a pleasure to be here with everybody. Um, my first poem was inspired by a walk I took this spring. It's called The Importance of Flowers. Rescuing a cluster of pink blossoms lying next to the sidewalk, I inhale my mother's silk scarf and cradle the velvet petals. Immediately, I am caught in the slipstream of time, emerging as the little girl in a blue jumper carrying a bouquet of fresh flowers. That morning, my mother braved a thicket of spring grass to snip forsythias and cut bunches of lily of the valley. She wrapped the flowers in waterlogged paper towels secured with wax paper and a loose rubber band. That I, felt day special. I felt special that day, bringing flowers for Mary's altar set up in the front of my fourth grade classroom. I cupped the pink flowers in my palm as carefully as I carried the Mary bouquet to school. Inscribed in my memory, a soft focus Polaroid of the days when the Hail Mary was a rote prayer, recited before every class, and the phrase, now and at the hour of our death, held no fear. That's Annie, Ann Bracken. Our next poet who's in the book is Jeffrey Himes. Jeff is a cultural historian. He's a poet, he's a musician. He is the author of Bruce Springsteen's biography and he's a journalist, but tonight he's our poet. Which poem did you choose from the book, Jeff, to read us? I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with uh, March, 2020. Um, and it, I was, you know, I was struck at that time that it was a, an especially beautiful springtime. And yet there was all this, you know, pandemic, uh, death floating around and the, the contrast, this is a poem about that contrast. Um, March, 2020. The weather outside is spring glorious, sun soaked, green grassed, daffodil dappled. It's the weather inside within our bodies that is storm blown and ice locked. Tiny spiky balls bounce through our arteries Pinballs, no flippers can stop from the cavities they crave. They drop into our lungs or they hatch babies like rabbits in skin shiny lesions. Whenever we open the front door, we're masked like outlaws, gloved like butlers. The only thing we can share is distance measured by the length of a corpse. When we walk through petal twirling breezes, sharp knives, too small to see, seeking our orifices come flying. After many months of purgatory, 
when the now blossom blanketed trees are bare and dusted with snow, what will we salvage from the wreckage? When the windscape turns wintry, will our insides at long last have their spring glorious breaking of bud into blossoms? That is the voice of Jeff Himes. And um, he has another poem that we'll hear from him later. Next, we're going to hear from Diane Wilburn Parks. And Diane is um, the best artist in America. <laughs> I'm just saying, and I don't gush much. She's really a fabulous visual artist, as well as a poet. And she's the director of The Right Blend. And they are the right blend of sex, race, creed, the gender. It's a collective, it's a good collective. So let's hear your poem from the book, Singing in the Dark. Thank Diane. you so much. Thank you so much, Grace. Uh, the title of my poem is Isolated Wings. I wrote this about 40 days into uh, the pandemic or the isolation. So it's titled Isolated Wings. We are snowed in in spring, listening to indulgence from the chirps of birds, fluttering feet and faces of sun-drenched homes rising opening the gold of blue skies. The world props against windows and doors, wishing for wings and the songs of birds. For more than 40 days, we've been flying into windows with untrained wings, caged inside walls, inside oily fingerprints left on glass. I keep wiping the edges of you off cleaning the traces of your wild baby's breath, now marred with Lysol. April cringes inside its bloom, afraid to lurk beyond its curled tongue, leaflet buds. Windows listen for wind-rushed poetic mewlings. The color of dance is a strong song, wept in a brush of uncut grass and the husk of sycamore trees. Sleeves of rice bleed grain by grain. We eat sparingly. We see a man dancing in the center of the earth with meat skins whistling sound like flutes. These isolated iridescent wings can't fly, even fish feathers into water. Life is still a flutter. Paddled fins wade in waters that still flow and the mist of white clouds return blue. The world props against cheeks and chests. Windows lick the oily salt of our skin while fingers flap in and out of dreams. Unmasked words wish to be free again. Without outstretched wings, we lift our opens, point our perch bodies to the wind. We twist our cages and bend them back while the cageless man still dances in the feathers of his skin. Diane Wilburn Parks, your poetry is as colorful as your art. And now we present Nishi Chava. She is the editor of this book. I don't know what it took, but she's gonna tell us about it. But first she's going to give us her own poem, Nishi Chavla. Thank you, Grace. It's true that uh, living through this crisis and the magnitude of the pandemic that has changed us all in intangible as well as in visible ways, uh, emotionally, psychologically, and socially, all of us have become poets in one way or the other, reflecting upon uh, life around us. This is my poem titled Inside Myself. The virus licks my torn soul, guilt tripping me. I sing a love song to it, tempting the faint thump, causing my heart to fissure its fatty lumps. Pretend I live on a moon of my own landing, turning my flesh inside out, listen to the chirping of birds, amazed that so much beauty could still exist amid club-like spikes that crush the breathing soul, lavender storms that hit, unfounded hopes cluster phylogenetically, a pestilence that asks for enormous surcharges 
lethal as the protean cry of daggers stabbing me yet again, quietly slithering out a warlike stratagem as birds orchestrate their cheerful songs to each other, embraced in positive sense RNA. The hard truths that no flowers on our windowsills would relive, proteins that slice human voices, sliced lungs pause, then breathe. When I follow its replication pattern, somewhere a flood of tears ensue, attached to a host receptor, slyly pursuing a purpose-driven path. Winter turns into stunned spring, and yet the stalk of the spike molecules sticks, digs deep within, encodes hollow dreams, hollowed out. In the open fields, the birds shriek with intense, tormented sounds, adopt a transmembrane-like structure, and more and more are rendered mute, transfixed fear, packaging signals of sliding down, motionless companions that express a fear, triggering viral particles, spreading out, binding domains of dazed displeasure, disbelief, a tissue culture, receptors and protein that inject so much, a solar vision that gives me a new calm, a prayer that sparks nucleocapsids of refined pleasure, gone. I struggle with myself again, umpteen times more. Nishi Chavla, whatever got into you to think you could do this? What gave you the idea for this? How did you put it together? And tell us about your co-editor. To identify the exact moment of enlightenment or nirvana for anything that seizes the mind. On a primal level, uh, inspiration sprang from our urge to make sense of what is happening in our lives as the crisis uh, plunges us deeper into a new reality that is virus driven. Uh, human beings have long turned to creative expression in times of crisis. Well, every social and emotional crisis inspires and fosters creative expression. Uh, the poems in our anthology, of course, wrestle with the issues surrounding and confronting us now. Uh, the title, In the Dark Times, will they also be singing? Yes, they will also be singing about the dark times. We chose the title of an anthology from Bertolt Brecht, who is better known to the English speaking world for his plays. Remember his epic theater? Although it was from his poetry that Brecht ventured into drama. So uh, we all know that the most acute rendering of an era sensibility is its poetry. Our poetry anthology, Singing in the Dark, includes over a hundred poetic voices across the globe responding to and reflecting on these unprecedented times as we are convulsed in and engulfed within the throes of the pandemic. The anthology is a kind of extended meditation on the very nature of our present reality. Uh, when I approach the noted uh, Indian poet K. Sachidanand, a word about his biography, uh, Dr. K. Sachidanand, uh, has been a professor of English literature. He has authored more than 30 books, about 25 poetry collections of poetry, uh, several one act plays. He's also been a journalist, a uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, a critic, noted critic, the CEO of India's Academy of Arts called the Sahitya Academy, also the director of the Kerala Literature Festival, where I actually met him. To come back to the point that when I approached the noted Indian poet K. Sajidanand and suggested that we compile a collection of poems on the theme of the pandemic, he readily agreed. Uh, so we plunged into our labor of love in, with an uncanny determination and passion. Uh, we also realized that it's important to make it a record of a somewhat traumatic, drawn out collective experience. The Pandemic has altered us in uh, several ways, of course, our sense of human interaction. So this anthology on a collection uh, focused on a single theme and similar subject matter 
should be able to fashion and uncover a collective inner monologue by way of individual responses. And uh, Penguin Random House was uh, kind of, they responded very soon after we offered them the proposal. And uh, that's how things uh, uh, got, well, we put together everything, compiled the anthology of about 400 pages. And then of course it had to be uh, sliced down to about 350 pages or so. And um, it was released in, yes, it was released in uh, October, end of pretty. October. Pretty. It's really pretty. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's beautiful. It's really a hard earned, hard won work on your part. I know what it takes to yes. go all through to color. It's very those intense. The summer was very intense, about 20 hours every day. I was working like crazy. I had to. I got a frozen shoulder and all of that. Nishi Chavla. She well, taught English in Delhi, India, and then migrated to this area in the DC area and then started teaching at the University of Maryland. She's a dramatist, a poet, an educator, and we're going to hear more from her later. Now I'm going to ask our poets here to choose a poem from the book other than their own and give us, set it up for us while you chose it who it's by, and give us a little bit of a sense of the great feast that's in this book. So the first person who's going to do this, let me see, is going to be Jeff. You're muted, Jeff. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm going to read a poem by an Indian poet named Kumar Ambuj, um, translated from the Hindi. Uh, I, I really like this poem because it's, it seems to uh, combine Walt Whitman and Franz Kafka and mm. sort of chanting oratorical style of Whitman and the sort of uh, uh, metaphorical paranoia of Kafka, which seems to fit this pandemic <laughs> era that we're going through. The title of this poem is Official Deaths Are a Superstition. They say that no one has seen it clearly till today, but like a virus, it can be anywhere. Whenever immunity is low, it catches hold. If someone runs away, a gunshot hits him on the back. If he stays still, a gunshot hits him on the forehead. Then comes the official statement, no one has died only a few people are missing. Then in the search for the missing people, many start to die. In the verandas of courts, secretariats, police stations, hospitals, in the fields and barns, in the prisons, in crowds, amid the springtime happiness of the majority, they fall with the falling leaves. The winds sweep them away into the universe. Even the Judicial Enquiry Committee learns nothing. People begin to die in such a way that they themselves don't know they have died. Dead men have no homes. Mm. Their own people refuse to recognize them. The way they refuse to recognize unclaimed bodies. They are expelled even from the, from the footpaths. Everywhere, everyone only asks them for their papers, wives, children, neighbors. They all say, get your papers. The government too solaces. You're alive. Just show your papers. Work, water, food, laughter. They forget everything else and look only for their papers. But in their whole world, these papers can't be found anywhere. Tired, defeated, they come to believe they, with their family, have died. Mm. Then they themselves begin to say, we've been dead for centuries. We died in the womb itself. We have no papers. We are naturally dead. We have no papers. Our ancestors come to live on this earth before papers. They left a long time ago and they left no papers. Mm. The government says, we never kill anyone. We are simply enforcers of the law. Official deaths are superstition. Everyone dies their own death. The newspapers and the TV channels remind us of this day and night. 
That is so powerful. What country is that, Jeff? India. Wow. It doesn't feel as if it's, it comes from an American poet. That's the interesting thing. The, the, the tone, the word choice, that's so interesting. And another poet, um, who would like to read another one from the book? Anne, what poet, who did you choose? Uh, I chose Joy Harjo, the U.S. Poet Laureate. Just uh, nominated for a second term. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Well, I think she's quite worthy of it. And um, the poem is called I Give You Back. And I chose the poem because for me, it's a fierce testament of letting go of burdens and letting go of trauma. I release you, my beautiful and terrible fear. I release you. You were my beloved and hated twin, but now I don't know you as myself. I release you with all the pain I would know at the death of my children. You are not my blood anymore. I give you back to the soldiers who burned down my house, beheaded my children, raped and sodomized my brothers and sisters. I give you back to those who stole the food from our plates when we were starving. I release you, fear, because you hold these scenes in front of me, and I was born with eyes that can never close. I release you, I release you, I release you, I release you. I'm not afraid to be angry. I'm not afraid to rejoice. I'm not afraid to be black. I'm not afraid to be white. I am not afraid to be hungry. I am not afraid to be full. I am not afraid to be hated. I am not afraid to be loved, to be loved, to be loved, fear. Oh, you have choked me, but I gave you the leash. You have gutted me, but I gave you the knife. You have devoured me, but I laid myself across the fire. I take myself back, fear. You are not my shadow any longer. I won't hold you in my hands. You can't live in my eyes, my ears, my voice, my belly, or in my heart. My heart, my heart, my heart. But come here, fear. I am alive. Mm. And you are so afraid of dying. Mm. Beautifully read, Anne. That was beautiful. I'm going to send that out to my workshops who are studying the list. Mm -hmm. Because look at the, how inventive she was with the list. She changed it up so much. You know, it's not, it is not just vertical. That's beautiful. Um, Diane, who did you choose and from what country in the anthology? I chose uh, a poem by Amir Orr, and he is an Israeli poet novelist and essayist. He actually wrote uh, this poem. It's a short poem, but it's, it packs a lot of power. He wrote it uh, in he Hebrew as well as English. Mm. The title of this poem, I, I, let me tell you why I love this poem. It's titled Reflection. And in my work, I do use a lot of light and shadows. And when I, and mirrors, so when I saw this, I was immediately drawn to it. So I, I'll read it, reflection. These are reflections that became frozen forever. This is the mirror room of memory. A child in the darkness plays hide and seek with shadows, sinks into the secret places of the stairs, turns into a shadow. A child in the dark separates from his image, dreams his face inwards. In a mirror of darkness, he reveals light and sees. Is the, I Hebrew, love it. Is the Hebrew on the page as well as the English? No, it's only English, but it, it does say that it was written in um, Hebrew Originally. as well. Right. And do you use, uh, you really use reflection and light in your paintings? in my paintings and in my poetry. Uh -huh. And what, you know, Grace, what I love about this poem is that the child that's playing hide and seek, he plays hide and seek with the, behind stairs and becomes a, a shadow. And then he dreams himself and sees him his own face <laughs> as he turns inwardly. So, so the reflection in this 
poet and his poem is so many places in the poem. I love it. It's fabulous. It's a prism. That's what this book is. I mean, really, it is. This book is a panoply of different ideas and thoughts and personalities. So Nishi Chavla, who have you chosen to represent the book and what country is it from? Grace, uh, I've chosen uh, Najwan Darwish. His poem uh, titled The Last Mask. He's a Palestinian poet. And uh, I liked it because the apparatus of poetry seems to be transformed in this poem. Let me read it out to you first. The Last Mask. I have not found it yet. The writing that liberates, that I once grabbed hold of, floundering in those suburbs. The writing that resembles passion and youth and the delights of the flesh in the way it surprises. I've not found it and maybe I'll stop looking for I'm busy with trifles. My knife is dull now and I'm pretending I have no time to sharpen it. Time put on its masks and called to me from behind the newborn in the cradle, the infant on in all fours, the child's first steps, the stumbling ad ad adolescent, the misgivings of the youth, and the grown man's despair. Time called to me from behind all the frail and aging promises when time has no more masks to wear. But now I've got to crawl and walk and stumble forward and chase down my misgivings and precede all the promises as I stretch myself out in the coffin, the last mask is in my hands and I must wear it now. Mm. Uh, the poet seems to be a kind of restless innovator who disrupts uh, genric uh, conventions, breaking up the coherence of simple poems and bringing into his own poem a uh, kind of, you know, an intense personal ambivalence. Uh, it's got its ellipses, its jagged edges. It seems to, you know, disrupt formal coherence, traditionally enforced by tonal and figural continuity. It gives us, so it's kind of, you know, it gives us fodder for thought. And therefore I like it. You know, do you know this poet? I happened to uh, be part of a Zoom discussion uh, that was organized uh, from Mumbai with a group of poets uh, from across the globe. This was just uh, three days ago. Oh. And Najwan Darwish was also invited. He came in and he read in Arabic, which was like, you know, I, I don't know Arabic, but it was like music to my ears, poetry to my ears. It was very intense and a wonderful experience. Beautiful. And Najwan Darwish, he is born in Jerusalem, uh, Palestine. He has been described as one of the foremost Arabic language poets of the generation and, you know, written a lot of poems. Well, he'll see this show and hear he, I hope you'll let him know that you read his poem and he'll hear you read it, I hope. I shall definitely tell him, yes. <laughs> and so um, we have an anthology of a hundred voices from various countries. It's quite thrilling to be part of this. And I wanted Jeff to talk a little bit about why it matters. I mean, so what? So we have an anthology of 400, 300 pages. What is the significance of putting together all these voices from so many countries and crossing so many bridges? What does it say about our culture? I think, um, I think we read anthologies for similar reasons to the reasons we read books by a single author. We, we read a book by a single author, <clears throat> we're trying to get a sense of the character and personality of that author. And when we read an anthology, we're trying to get a sense of the character and personality of a community. Hmm. Uh, of, you know, and a community that's defined by whatever reason the anthologist chooses. You know, it could be uh, a, you know, a geographic community, it could be a uh, thematic community, um, it could be a, a sort of demographic community. And in, in this case, it's a community that's united by this great historical event that we've been living through um, of this pandemic. And, uh, you know, I think that by reading these poems, we get a sense of what it was like to be, uh, to live in this time and to you know, experience these things that we've been experiencing 
And but the you know the great uh, advantage of poetry, of course, is that we get both the subjective and the objective experience mixed together in a way that journalism can't match. Well said, Jeff. You always make clarity out of chaos and sometimes chaos out of clarity. <laughs> that was really nice because um, I think if we keep sending poetry out there, it's like one more pillar keeping civilization from falling into the mud. That's the way I feel about it. And this anthology has 400 reasons uh, let us go back to our own poetry in this. And Anne, you have another poem in the book. Yes, I so do. You have a second poem. You're going to give it to us. Yes. What it's is called, it? Set it's it up. In Need of Imagination. I wake to the call of the warbler, another morning where the flame of inspiration sputters under the intangible sense that life has been suspended. Preparing coffee feels fractious. The pulse and whir of grinding beans, the tangle of electric cords waiting for the day to begin with toasting and blending and boiling. My country wraps itself in hubris despite bridges routinely collapsing. Sunlight fractals on the brook. I hold a leaf in my palm, hoping for an end to the unsparing rigidity of the powerful. Mm. Mm. You bring that home. What's that last line again? Um, I hold a leaf in my palm, hoping for an end to the unsparing rigidity of the powerful. Bring it home, Anne. <laughs> bring it home. You Diane. gotta have hope. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? Diane, um, you're going to read another one from the anthology. Yes, I am. And the title of this poem is Otters, and it is by E.V. Ramakrishan. From what country? I believe, and you know what? It doesn't have where he, unless he's on the other side. I don't see where he. Ravi, does that sound in, like from yeah, India? Yes, from, from India. India. Okay, okay. Okay, so I will read his poem. It is entitled Otters. Otters taught me how to be. There is no need to be seen to see oneself. Man was a rumor they did not believe in. They were seek conscious of larger things that stretched beyond the clock and the calendar. As I turned away from them, the crowded seashore became desolate like a vandalized mausoleum. Diane, um, we're going to go back now to Jeff, who has a poem, another poem. Right. This is your own, so set it up. So this is a, a poem about um, how sometimes art can be inadequate for the uh, situation as horrible as one we've been living through. It's called <clears throat> Performing Arts Centers. If I read one more simpering poem full of flowers and abstract nouns, or hear one more sensitive song full of arpeggios and winding paths, I swear I'm going to burn down a performing arts center. <laughs> Don't you get it? Nature isn't going to save us. The coronavirus is nature. That mm -hmm. microscopic ball with the hooks is an organism as committed to its own survival and as indifferent to ours as the shadiest apple tree in bloom. Nature is as terrifying as it is inspiring and anyone who doesn't acknowledge both halves of that truth disrespects nature as much as the worst polluter. Is nature, but so is the fire that killed his mother. Nature is all we've got. From the smallest virus to the proudest ape, no master is dangling the marionette strings. No ghosts are pushing around the furniture. The virus wants the wet warmth of our lungs, and so do we. Who will be the smarter? I'm not really going to burn down a performing arts center, but I am going to picture it in my mind. Those not so smart 
sensitive souls screaming, their rose-tinted glasses cracking in the heat, their peasant chic shirts smoking on their backs. Jeffrey Himes. Always, he always keeps us going. You, you wake us up. You always wake us up, Jeff. And we have, uh, Anne, you have another poem in the book. Uh, well, I have one from another poet. Yeah, who is it? Uh, his name is Max Garland. And what he's country? American. He's a U.S. Okay. poet. He's an American poet. This is Wisconsin. Yes. His poem is, we're so familiar with this phrase that had no meaning a year ago, social distancing. <laughs> Say there came a pandemic. Some news drunk virus sets, it, sets its hooks in us and only the sky for a nurse uh, arched and empty and barely even blue. And only the musical pulse and the several senses for consolation, except for a stream of distant words like waves bearing the rush, curl and foam of elsewhere arriving the distant rhythm of others to bridge the gap between head and heart, dark and day, fear, and whatever it is one feels on the brink, on the brink of when walking next to great waters, how the surf catches and releases the light, and the waves and bones tremble like the distant cousins of constant thunder. Mm. We know salt tumbles eventually, from ocean to body and back and forth. We know it takes ages to regather the shaken self into the good world again. I remember a ritual once where hundreds of tiny basket-like boats were lit and launched with prayers and flowers and misfortunes, ignited and cast out on the water until the bay was ablaze, a rocking constellation of human woe uttered in small tongues of flame, until little by little they drifted, burned, and blinked out and then it was just dark water again, and we all went home. Did our troubles never return? Were we really less burdened or better people? What I mean is sometimes worry needs to be ignited, launched into words, if only to blaze a while among flotillas of sorrow we thought were ours alone. What I really mean, of course, is keep in touch, even if you don't know what to say, especially if you don't know what to say. Kind words, fellow castaways, mind-lit emergencies of fingertip and tongue. Float this festival of downtime and distance. Repopulate the dark with your fledgling human light. Why did you choose that? What did you like about it, Anne? I loved his images with the tiny boats out on the water. Um, it reminds me of what people do a lot of times on the anniversary of the Hiroshima bombing. Uh, they launch little boats out onto the water with candles in them. Mm. And that's kind of what came to mind when I was reading his poem. Mm. We're going to uh, end with Nishi. Chavla with her own poem from the book. I'm going to read Infinite Karmas. Uh, so the pandemic has uh, violated the Hindu law of karma. So I thought of Infinite Karmas as the title of my poem. At the beginning was the outbreak, blobs of swarming virus caught red-handed, fastened themselves on human lungs, Above those karmic laws that got bled out, the stars rip, the effects of human intention strayed, swelled. How one lives front-lined with gloves and masks, mock at causality, casually proliferate in invisible tweets with red mountain clouds, dismantle the short supply of legends that look us in the eye, comfort us for no reason, does it clink a glass or two now that the karmic wheel got broken? 
does it dodge bullets whittled by the dark scraping, bend its shapes inside the deep flesh in cruel thumps, knowing no clear patterns of reactionary consequences, pacing oneself to match an invisible fugu-like enemy that rings in waves of new energy in unison with the crevices the virus revisits, wild affliction, dead to the pangs of love, of lust, reaping the aroused days of its own self. Karma scapic bounds, where is the blind eye of fate here? Discriminate between willing it, nor etched, nor accrued, accrued in discreet scoops, shields of our own actions, generating, flourishing between the responsible and not so. Thank you. That's Chavla, Nishi Chavla, who is co-editor of this fabulous book. This is all you need. I'm telling you, there's something of everything in this book. And it's so interesting because each country has such a different flavor, such a different mm -hmm. tone. I, to, uh, to end the program, I'm going to read a poem by uh, Sabina Pascarelli. It's called May 2020. Now, Sabina lives in Tuscany. This is to show you just how many people are represented. She lives um, about 20 miles west of Florence in a little town called Montespertoli. And she is a fabulous, beautiful translator of poetry. And this is, she writes in many languages. She wrote this in English. It's called May 2020. I watch the behavior of the people on the street. A variety of stories is hidden behind the protecting masks. Is this the end of trust? Eyes don't meet eyes. Hands pointing to the ground, empty of gestures. Feet moving in silence. The young woman working in the studio of an architect takes off her mask to greet me. How are you? Without waiting for my answer, she assures me of how well she is. Eyes contradicting lips. Times are tough for many, she says, her voice a balance of fear and control. I wish I could say something of comfort. As she walks away, half down the street, I see her speak to someone else. Aimless love keeps us in its claws, I think. I don't know how this sentence comes to me. That's Sabina Pascarelli. Um, this is the poet in the poem. We wish it was from the, from the Library of Congress, but we are in uno senso, in virtual reality. And someday we will be back in those marble halls again. I'm Grace Cavalieri. The funders for this show are the Revada Foundation of the Logan Family and the Sinipid Fund. We would like to dedicate this program to Jeannie Mosier, who is actually one of the world's greatest art activists and left us all Thanksgiving night at midnight. And she is the shiniest star in the sky right now forevermore. So we wanna dedicate this program to her. We, we ask if any of you want to review this book, you get a free book, hey, what more could you ask for? And if you do want to review it, you have one of our emails, I'm sure, any one of you out there, but you have to tell us the literary magazine in which it, the review will appear, or else you don't get a free book, uh -huh. believe me. So uh, if you can review it, let us know. I know everyone in the world has my email, I feel sure. So um, get in touch with us if you want it. Thank you, Nishi Shava. Thank you, Shavla. Shavla. Mm -hmm. Nishi Shavla. Thank Shavla. you very much. For Thank this, you, everyone. Thank for you. For doing this for us. And this, I'm Grace Cavalieri, and this is The Poet and the Poem in the Ether. <laughs> Bye.